tonight from the driver's seat at Toyota to the hot seat on Capitol Hill. The company president apologizes and vows to win back America's trust. My name is on every car. I'm Katie Couric. Also tonight, is there a double standard in Japan? The same government agency that's supposed to regulate Toyota promotes it as well. A killer whale attacks and kills a trainer at SeaWorld in Florida as the audience watches in horror. And it's kind of a magic bag. It may not look big enough, but one can deliver food to 50 hungry kids. From CBS News World Headquarters in New York, this is the CBS Evening News with Katie Carrick. Good evening, everyone. It is unprecedented. The head of a major international corporation testifying under oath before the United States Congress. Today, the president of Toyota made his long-awaited appearance on Capitol Hill and began by saying in English, quote, I'm deeply sorry. Sorry for the safety defects that have led to crashes linked to at least 39 deaths in this country and more than 8 million recalls worldwide. And then the grilling began. We have two reports tonight. First, national correspondent Dean Reynolds, who was at the hearing. And Dean, I know Akio Toyota was pressured to appear today. Do you think he did himself any good? Well, Katie, considering the damage that's been done to his company, he really had to come. Staying away would have been unthinkable. But judging from the tone of the questions he took here today, it's clear that he's going to face continuing skepticism. With a virtual army of reporters and photographers on his heels, the man at the top of Toyota arrived on Capitol Hill to an intense reception more in line with a visiting head of state than a foreign industrialist. But Akio Toyota was sworn in like any other witness before Congress and quickly offered an act of contrition. I am deeply sorry for any accident that Toyota drivers have experienced. The grandson of Toyota's founder, but now running an automaker that's recalled more cars than it sold in one year, Toyota got a taste of the anxiety and anger that's grown along with his car's defects. We had a great deal of faith in something that was stamped made in Japan, that it was of the highest reliability. And you, 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 you injured that thought process in the American public. How do you say to them that we can trust you now? Toyota told the committee that in his company's race to expand, it had confused its priorities of placing safety first, quality second, and volume third. We are not able to stop, think, and make improvements as much as we are able to be lawmakers expressed outrage over Toyota's culture of secrecy and disbelief that runaway cars were caused only by shoddy pedals or bunched floor mats. One congressman lectured Toyota's top North American official, Yoshimi Inaba, over a company paper boasting $100 million had been saved by limiting a safety probe. This is one of the most embarrassing documents I've ever seen. This is absolutely appalling, sir. How could you possibly put in writing th this? I had no idea what the company was, oh, and that's why our staff wanted to give me a, a orientation material. Through a translator, Toyota said his company would deal differently with complaints from now on, consult outside experts on the need for recalls, and provide all the information U.S. safety investigators may request. But today, Toyota seemed to have little of it at his fingertips. He said he'd test-driven the recalled models, but he had no idea when he heard of their problems. He recalled an urgent meeting with U.S. officials about his products last fall, but could not remember what was said. Still, he clearly knew his credibility was on the line, so he got personal. My name is on every car. You have my personal commitment that Toyota will work vigorously and unceasingly to restore the trust of our customers. But if this hearing showed anything at all, it is just how much more work he needs to do. Dean Reynolds, CBS News, Capitol Hill. I'm Celia Hatton in Tokyo. For the man who triumphantly introduced the Prius last year, it's been a humbling fall. Akio Toyota, grandson of the company's founder, has already made three apologies in Japan, where there's only one way to say sorry, with a bow. It's an age-old tradition here for companies caught selling bad products or deceiving the public. The deeper the bow, the thinking goes, the deeper the remorse. 
And once the bowing's over, the Japanese government often allows Japanese corporations to tackle their problems in private. But that's changing slowly. It is clearly pressure in the United States that has forced Toyota to handle this problem differently than they would have wanted to. Toyota is an economic juggernaut in Japan. It's the country's largest company by sales, $230 billion last year, and one of its biggest employers, about 70,000 people. For decades, Toyota enjoyed the government's staunch support, like many other major corporations here. The government department that handles the advancement of industries is the same office that regulates safety, explains legal scholar Tsuneo Matsumoto. They usually handle things so they won't hinder the progress of the industries. But the uproar over Toyota has some critics asking why the government's protecting corporations over its own people and endangering lives abroad. And the government's listening. 38 consumer complaints about runaway Toyota vehicles are now being investigated in Japan. We would like to re-examine the auto recall process, says Japan's transport minister. Toyota's corporate culture is facing an overhaul, too. Since the 1950s, the company's made decisions by building consensus among employees, which can be slow and can discourage whistleblowers who are afraid of being singled out. A Japanese proverb reads, beginning is easy, continuing is hard. The Japanese government and Akio Toyota have already vowed to change their ways, but both have a hard road ahead. Celia Hatton, CBS News, Tokyo. Now, you may have noticed that while the company is Toyota, the company president is Toyoda with a D. And if you're wondering why, it goes back to his grandfather. Back in 1937, when he started the car company, he changed the spelling, and here's why. In Japanese, it takes 10 pen strokes to write the family name Toyoda. But if you leave off those last two little strokes, you get Toyota. That's only eight strokes, so it's simpler to write. And in Japan, eight is a lucky number. Meanwhile, in Florida today, it started out the way it usually does. Tourists gathered for a show at SeaWorld in Orlando. Then, without warning, something went terribly wrong. Kelly Covea tells us that as the horrified audience watched, a killer whale attacked one of the park's most experienced trainers and drowned her. The popular Shamu show at Orlando's SeaWorld hadn't yet begun when the park's largest killer whale, a 12,300-pound male orca named Tilikum, swam toward 40-year-old female trainer Dawn Branshu and, according to one witness, pulled her underwater. She was standing on the rocks right above the viewing area. He jumped out, he, like he took off, and then he came back, he jumped off, grabbed her, started thrashing around, and then her shoe fall, fell off. I mean, he was, he was thrashing her around pretty good. It was violent. A tourist at an earlier show said the animal seemed agitated. I, just, I, I wish and pray that they hadn't gotten to the pool since the whale was clear that it was upset. And um, you know, I just my prayers go to that person's family. SeaWorld closed part of the park and canceled killer whale shows in Orlando and San Diego. We have never in the history of our parks experienced an incident like this. Yet this killer whale reportedly has been involved in another death at SeaWorld. In July of 1999, a man apparently stayed in the park after hours, jumped into the animal's tank and was killed. And in 1991, before being sent to SeaWorld Orlando, Tilikum and two female killer whales drowned a young trainer at a Canadian park called Sealand of the Pacific. Other killer whales have been known to turn on their trainers in 2004 at SeaWorld in San Antonio and in 2006 at SeaWorld in San Diego. The worst of the injuries in those cases was a broken foot. This particular killer whale normally doesn't have swimmers in the tank with it because of its size and strength. It's primarily used for splashing the audience. We were able to reach Dawn Branchu's mother late this afternoon. She told us that Dawn was one of six children. She loved animals and she will be missed. Katie? So sad. Kelly Covea in Miami tonight. Kelly, thank you. Across the country in San Jose, California, an energy company said today it has the answer to America's power problems. It's called the Bloom Box, and its inventor says it can power an entire home. John Blackstone tells us the idea is backed by some serious star power. Seldom has the unveiling of a gray box the size of a parking space been surrounded by such hype. It's my baby, isn't she beautiful? But its inventor says what's inside the box can supply the world with clean, cheap energy. 
The core of our technology simply is sand. The sand is the raw material used to make these wafers that can make electricity. What I want to introduce to you, the Bloom Energy Fuel Cell. Bloom's fuel cell works like this. Oxygen is pumped in on one side, natural gas on the other. The two combine inside the cell to create a chemical reaction that produces electricity. No burning, no combustion, no power lines from outside. Bloom's founder has persuaded some big names that by using sand, he can make fuel cells that are efficient and inexpensive. Well, will it work for 10 or 20 years without something going wrong? We'll find out. Bloom Energy says the best proof that its fuel cells work is in the ones already working, like these at eBay's headquarters. But Bloom is not the only company pursuing this kind of technology. Among Bloom's many competitors, UTC Power has built fuel cells for some businesses. Now the race is on to see who can make them affordable. A half dozen big companies have already bought Bloom boxes at a cost of seven to eight hundred thousand dollars. There's always the hope that the price will come all the way down, like it did with computers. Bloom's goal is a $3,000 box that anybody can use to power their home. Think of this. Don't start signing up for orders yet. This is a product of the future. A future that's at least a decade away. John Blackstone, CBS News, San Jose, California. And looking ahead to tomorrow and that much-anticipated summit at the White House, the president is gathering House and Senate leaders, Democrats and Republicans, to try to save health care reform. Nancy Cordes is our congressional correspondent. And Nancy, shades of the Paris peace talks, the Republicans have been arguing about the shape of the table and the seating arrangement. What's that all about? That's right, Katie. They want to avoid giving the president the upper hand. So first they said they didn't want him standing at a podium tomorrow where he might lecture them like Professor Obama. And then when the White House wanted the table that everyone would sit at to look something like this with the president sitting at the center, the Republicans said no, the table should look more like this where everyone would be a bit more equal. And the White House said okay. So now that's settled, what about the really big issues? Does the president have any chance of reaching some kind of compromise with Republicans on health care reform? Well, that's looking a lot less likely, Katie. In fact, just a few moments ago, I asked the Republican leader, Mitch McConnell, whether there was any chance for compromise, given the fact that the president was unlikely to heed his demands that they scrap the entire Democratic bill and start over. Unless they're willing to do that, I, I think it's nearly impossible to, to imagine a scenario under which we could reach an agreement. So the White House is less focused on this point at winning over the Republicans and it's more focused on winning over wavering Democrats who will all have to hang together, Katie, if they're finally going to pass a health care bill. All right. Nancy Cordes. Nancy, thanks very much. And still ahead on the CBS Evening News, a teacher turned hero. We'll never know how many lives he might have saved. But up next, why did the system fail to stop that pediatrician in Delaware from abusing his young patients? Dr. Earl Bradley is a Delaware pediatrician charged with sexually abusing 103 patients and videotaping some of the worst offenses. Anguished parents had to watch freeze frames of those videos to determine if their children were among the alleged victims, some as young as two. And Jan Crawford tells us as horrible as this case is, it happens more often than you might think. The case of Dr. Earl Bradley follows a pattern. Whispers in the community, sporadic complaints to authorities, no action. She just came out and said, why did Dr. Bradley kiss my tongue? And so you called the police. We called the police that day. She is one of a half dozen parents we interviewed who say their children were molested and asked their identities so be concealed. The state prosecutors felt that there wasn't enough evidence um, to, to charge him or to go in with a search warrant. Um, it, it was, I mean, it was devastating. The shock and anger that has cast a dark cloud over this town is not confined to Lewis, Delaware. In doctor's offices in other towns and other cities across America, there are predators who parents trust to heal their children, not to hurt them. Over the last decade alone, in states across the country, nearly 20 pediatricians have been charged with abusing children. 
Those are the criminal cases. Most complaints never get past state medical boards. Pediatrician Eli Neuberger is a professor at Harvard Medical School. He compares pediatric child abuse to the priest scandal that rocked the Catholic Church. We're dealing, I think, with a systemic problem and an organized cover-up. Just last October, pediatrician Michael Roy Sharp was charged with raping a patient, a teenage girl. He had been fired from two hospitals in Tennessee after accusations of sexual misconduct, but he was never disciplined by medical authorities and set up practice in Alabama. Colleagues of Dr. Robert Marion in South Carolina allegedly had heard complaints about him abusing children, but they simply asked him to leave the practice. He moved to another office in the same building and kept many of his same patients. They never knew about his predatory behavior until he was charged with abusing four children. If the perpetrator is one of their colleagues and reporting would ruin that man's life and career, they would much sooner not report even if it endangered children. There's a code of silence, and I think that code was upheld to the nth degree in this case. Attorneys Craig Karsnitz, Bruce Hudson, and Ben Castle represent parents whose children were allegedly molested by Bradley. They say doctors and nurses at Babies Pediatrics and at the local medical center knew or suspected that Bradley was abusing patients for years. Just one could have stepped forward, and all of the girls that were victims after that could have been spared. Child advocates hope the Delaware case will raise awareness about a problem hidden for far too long. Jan Crawford, CBS News, Lewis, Delaware. A gunman opened fire at a middle school in Littleton, Colorado yesterday, wounding two students. But as Barry Peterson tells us, it might have been a lot worse. Kids from Deer Creek Middle School were heading home. 57-year-old math teacher Dr. David Benke was outside helping at the crosswalk when he heard a shot, saw a gunman, and instinct drove his next move. I noticed that he was working a bolt-action rifle and um, realized that I had time to get him before he could chamber another round. He ran and tackled the suspect. The next thing I know, I'm on the ground. I've got my legs wrapped around his legs. I've got my arms wrapped around him. Suspect Bruce o. Eastwood, 32 years old, is being held on a million dollars bond on two counts of attempted murder. A history of mental illness says his father is no excuse. I don't care who you are. You shouldn't go out there and take how you feel inside of you out on anybody else. Binky says that all he did wasn't enough. I felt like I wasn't fast enough, and he got us, as far as I know, a second round off. But it was enough for 13-year-old Reagan Weber, one of two students wounded in the attack, who says Binky's action saved lives. I think he's a hero. He obviously probably saved a lot more students. Teachers here and around the country have more security training because of what happened at a school about three miles from here. An incident that Americans remember by one name, Columbine. Asked why he reacted so quickly, Binky says the answer comes from a vow he made to his students during one of those post-Columbine safety drills about ever facing the real thing. I said, I, I hope that I'm capable of doing something about it. And so um, um, what was going through my mind was that I promised. Promise? kept. Barry Peterson, CBS News, Denver. We end tonight with two women making an unusual fashion statement. They have very special bags filled, as Michelle Miller tells us, with the American spirit. Handbags are one of the signature statements for every fashion conscious woman. I love the way this looks. I do like the size, actually. And Lauren like Bush and Ellen Gustafson have managed to turn this accessory um, into a necessity and the fight to end world hunger one bag at a time. There's no other option. We have to help feed these kids. We have to help get them into school. That's, that's the only option we have. The pair met four years ago through their work with the United Nations. What they witnessed inspired the launch of their collection, Feed. This was the first bag I designed. It's called the Feed One Bag. Their first bag, a $60 reusable shopping tote, provides a school meal for a child anywhere in the world for an entire year. 
world hunger seems so far away and so overwhelming for most people. So to know exactly what you're doing um, is great. Feed now has a dozen styles in some of New York's most popular stores. Prices range from $15 to $195. The costs vary because each bag does something different. It feeds two children in school for a year. And says so right on the back. So it's no surprise that when the earthquake hit Haiti, Feed designed the Feed Haiti 50 bag. It provides 50 school lunches to children there. That meal that a child gets in school is almost certainly the only proper meal that they get every day. Since 2007, Feed has donated five and a half million dollars to the UN World Food Program. To know that just through selling a product that we're then giving back to what is most essential in human life, which is food to thrive, it's, it's, it's powerful. It's very powerful. Success is counted in the number of meals served, 55 million in just three years, and in the faces of children who now smile in the absence of hunger. Michelle Miller, CBS News, New York. And that is the CBS Evening News. I'm Katie Couric. Thanks for watching. I'll see you tomorrow. Good night.